We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. My name is Anita Gurumurti. I'm from IT for Change, an India-based organization engaged in research and policy advocacy at the intersections of digital technologies, social justice, and gender equality. I welcome you all to this session that we are co-organizing with the Office of the UN Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Expression and Internet Lab. And the session is titled The Open Forum on Women's Right to Online Participation, Promise or Pipe Dream. We all live in times of a platformized public sphere. What this means is that just as platforms have enabled novel forms of speech and expression, they have also engendered new practices of speech regulation. In this brand new speech paradigm, liberal legal philosophy and jurisprudence somehow seem to really fall short. They were fully inadequate. Coordinated troll attacks on women and gender minorities do not operate like traditional silencing mechanisms. They create a crisis of unfreedom, taking away their right to equal part participation in the digital agoras. As the infrastructures of speech change social interaction, we are faced with the task of gendering the right to free expression all over again. That's why we are here today. And it's our belief that a multi-constituency dialogue is a starting point for this process. Judith Arenas, Senior Advisor, Office of the UN Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Expression will be moderating the session. She'll be introducing the panelists, but before I hand over to her, I just wanted to reiterate the questions the session is keen to examine. The first question is how are content governance standards to be set by platform companies so that they adhere to a universal baseline of women's human rights? Second, how can states design intermediary liability frameworks to achieve the fine balance between platform responsibility for redress against sexist hate online and preventing private censorship of online speech? And finally, what do we need to do to promote synergies between national policies, platform self-governance and community standards and a new regulatory approach to preserve freedoms and address harms? And what is the role, particularly in the context of the IGF, of the multilateral system in working towards this synergy? Over to you, Judith, and welcome everybody. Thank you very much, Anita, and once again, extending our warm welcome from the Americas to all of you joining from different parts of the world. On behalf of the Office of the UN Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Expression and Opinion, Irene Khan, I'm really delighted that we are able to partner with civil society in this extremely important session and this very important issue about women's right to online participation. On behalf of Irene Khan, I would like to extend a warm welcome to everyone, and as Anita has mentioned, to emphasize that we see this very much and very strongly as part of a process. This is, um, as I was commenting while we were waiting, we hope to be very much able to reconvene and continue the track process with the Internet Governance Forum um, and hope that this is only the beginning of, of, an, uh, you know, of a longer term process. Um, on behalf of Irene, she did ask me to send a few words. She was going to send a recorded message, but we did have some technical problems. Um, very apropos, um, but she wanted me to remind everyone and emphasize that for the first time in 27 years since the UN established the mandate of the Special Rapporteur on Promotion and Protection of Freedom of Opinion and Expression, this mandate is held by a woman. For 27 years, there has not been a gender dimension, and the second report that uh, the office has uh, produced, which was very much informed by the very thoughtful, insightful and detailed inputs that many of you online provided, was actually devoted exclusively to the particular challenges faced by women and gender non-conforming people in exercising their freedom of opinion and expression. 
The report in itself is only the beginning of a process. This Internet Governance Forum session is an ongoing one, and we hope to be able to continue to work with you to help figure out what are the specific recommendations that need to be made and need to be implemented by both member states, by companies, by media, by civil society, so that we can frankly end what is an unlawful interference with women's freedom of opinion and expression. But more than anything, that we are able to actually create create an enabling environment for women to exercise their agency and have full access to both information and ideas, both on and offline. This, um, Irene herself has said that women's voices are suppressed, controlled, or punished explicitly, explicitly by laws, policies, and discriminatory practices, and implicitly by social attitudes, cultural norms, and patriarchal values. Sexism and misogyny, which are dominant factors in gendered censorship, have been heightened by the rise of populist, authoritarian, and fundamentalist tax forces around the world. And in light of the dominant role of the internet world, it's particularly important that attention be paid to this evolving space in, online and to the impact of digital technology on the challenges that women face both physically and in online spaces. And I think it is particularly in this context where we know that there is a gender digital divide, where we know that we have gender data gaps and other barriers that frankly stop women from accessing their full right to information, that we figure out how we overcome these multiple divides. So it's in this context that really this conversation could not be more timely. It's a fantastic conversation that really allows us to be able to uh, fully engage with all of you and, and different participants um, and different means of experience. Um, and we're very, very grateful um, that you've allowed Irene to share these comments via who, someone who is not as good a, a speaker as her, but um, those were written by her, so they are truly her own words. But I hope that that helps set an overall scheme. And I will put in the chat the link to the report so that if anyone is interested, you can access the full link and see, um, and see the final uh, the final outcome, we are limited in UN reports with a word page limit, but all of the contributions are available online. So uh, for those of you that I know did send in very detailed contributions, rest assured that they were all fully, fully integrated. And with this over, we really want to now move into what I think is the most exciting part of our conversation today, and we need to figure out the what is next and how do we draw upon um, all the different pieces um, that we should be taking into account and, and really enriching it from a variety of government, intergovernmental, private sector, uh, civil society perspectives, uh, where we have a fantastic panel that I hope will be able to interact. We also have all of you who are in person and also joining us virtually, uh, please feel free to use the chat function the, so that you can let us know if you have comments. The way that we're gonna run this is we're gonna have some scene setters and enable our, our participants to just really lay out some of the key issues in, in, in an, what I hope will be an interactive conversation. And then really from there, be able to kind of move into a more broader discussion from, from all of you. And first of all, I am delighted to be able to welcome Elvira Garcia from the Directorate General of Human Rights of the Mexican Foreign Ministry. Elvira, we are particularly grateful that you're jumping in after some other. Um, Ambassador Buendrostro is representing Mexico on the UN Security Council and was pulled in at the last moment to participate in the Security Council session. So Elvira, we are so grateful that you are obviously a, a fantastic person to have and delighted that you're able to share some of the governmental perspectives. So perhaps we could go to you first, just to really, you know, as a country that has expressed a feminist foreign policy, we would love to hear your takes on what could be done. Over to you. Thank you very much, Judith. Uh, Mexico appreciates the organization of this important event and appreciates the invitation of the organizers. Ms. Uh, Ms. Irene Khan, the Special Rapporteur of the Promotion and promotion of Protection of the Right of Freedom of Opinion and Expression, 
offered in their last report a very valuable analysis of the challenges faced by all women and girls in online and offline spaces and made relevant recommendations to create an enabling environment and a safe digital space for all women and girls to enjoy the freedom of opinion and expression on equal uh, footing. As you may know, uh, since 2020, Mexico adopted a feminist foreign policy, which aims to promote a gender equality and the human rights of all women and girls at multilateral fora and in our bilateral and regional relations. In the particular and very relevant issue of freedom of expression and technology, uh, the participation of all women and girls must be a priority in promoting their empowerment and autonomy and overcoming the gaps that the digital world imposes, included gender digital divide. Digital platforms have provided a space uh, for activism, but they have also been shown to perpetuate gender power structures, gender stereotypes and patriarchal uh, values. Mexico recognizes the digital world and the development of new technologies as key catalysts for economic development and investment mm -hmm. with consequent benefits for employment and social welfare by reducing obstacles to economic participation, included the, including the participation of women in the economic sphere and achieving their economic autonomy. Um, this is the reason why it is um, of utmost uh, importance to continue uh, fighting for gender equality and women and girls' human rights and to adapt scientific strategies, technology, and innovation to address their empowerment and reduce inequalities, uh, including the digital gender divide. Uh, the digital world poses new challenges and in the case of all women and girls, it is not just about access, although we recognize that the ability to have meaningful internet access has a direct impact on the exercise of the right to freedom of expression and opinion, among other rights. We know that women in all their diversity also face, face challenges on availability, affordability, cultural discrimination and norms capacity and skills, availability of relevant content, and participation in decision-making roles on the internet and or in the technology sector, among other barriers. Uh, women and girls, including those in vulnerable situation, should be able to enjoy access to information relevant to them, including diversity in languages, interests, content, and context. Multiple forms of discrimination and violences against women and girls online, such as cyber stalking, uh, cyber bullying, harassment, or misogynist speech, limits their full uh, realization of women's human rights, including freedom of expression. Of course, we must also provide women and girls with a digital world free of violence to become a tool for their empowerment. One important achievement in Mexico was the adoption of the Ley Olimpia, which punishes the dissemination of intimate and sexual content without the consent of the person involved. Women and journalists not only face those risks suffered by their male peers, when they investigate and report human rights violations or political crisis situations, but women journalists have to address additional specific gender-based attacks, which analyzed with the intersection of other identities and socioeconomic uh, factors and conditions, increase their level of risk and create additional obstacles in their exercise of the right to freedom of expression. On the other hand, uh, gender stereotypes continue to exclude many women from participation in public debate and bar their free expression. Practice shows that the media considers women's opinion less important and they, that they expect women to fit into stereotyped roles and sexualized images of them. 
This situation results in the unequal power relations between men and women in the media world. This is contrary to what it is established in Beijing platform for action in its sphere of gender and media. For those reasons, we stress the term gender justice. As um, in the report uh, presented by Mrs. Khan, uh, there is an urgent need for transformative changes uh, and encompassing equity uh, and equality to break the structural and systemic barriers holding women back. Uh, one of Mexico's priority uh, is leave no one behind. Having a feminist foreign policy will enable us to place women and girls at the center of the country's welfare policies both at the national and international levels. In the case of freedom of expression, we have the responsibility to address factors that increase the likelihood of gender-based violence and harassment and multiple and intersecting forms of discrimination against all women and girls in media. It is especially relevant to involve more women and girls in STEM careers and media. Their participation in these space, uh, spaces undoubtedly promotes the elimination of gender stereotypes and inspires, inspires other uh, women and girls to participate in these areas that have traditionally been masculinized. It is therefore important to invest in the development of leadership skills in all women and girls. Under the principles of Mexico's feminist uh, foreign policy, we will continue to promote the inclusion of the gender perspective in all global issues. The vision of women uh, and girls must be considered to solve all of the challenges we face as humanity. Mexico is aware of the fact that its feminist uh, foreign policy will contribute significantly to the country's national development. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Elvira. That's a fantastic um, overview, uh, inspirational one as well to, to see the policy commitments. And thank you very much for flagging the Olympia law that we know has actually been so instrumental in really and the model law for many other countries. Um, one of the things that emerged in the Special Rapporteur's report is the issue of the dampening and the silencing effect that this climate of online and offline violence against women can actually have. Um, in fact, I, I would like to invite everyone, and I will also share this link, we are currently highlighting the cases of 16, of 10 journalists around the world where their voices have been silenced and they have received more gendered attacks simply for the fact that they're going about doing their journalistic work. And Mariana, I know that in, in Brazil, you have actually been documenting some of these specific examples. You know, the fact that uh, freedom of expression and freedom of opinion when limited can actually have a long-term negative impact on hampering women in political life and women journalists. Would you be able to perhaps share a little bit of that context of what your research has identified? Sure, thank you, Judith. Thank you all the folks at IT for Change for the invitation. Uh, I just like to start by saying that we really appreciate the Special Rapporteur's report, it aids us really immensely and it's very historical because, and this is what I, I want to speak about, seeing freedom of, of expression and women's rights as antithetical is only serving inequalities in the online environment, right? And this is what we're seeing in our empirical research, looking at the social media of politicians in Brazil during electoral periods and of journalists. Um, in the 2020 elections, we monitored over a hundred uh, profiles of women candidates. We were also monitoring uh, male candidates to compare. And we were able to see a striking difference, not only in the numbers of the offenses and attacks that these women were getting on social media, but also on the sorts of attacks uh, the kind of things that women get online. Uh, when we're looking sp specifically at the um, social media of 
women uh, from all the messages they got around 10% in Twitter and on YouTube uh, of all those messages, they contained offensive terms. Sometimes they were not offensive, but, but they contained off offensive terms. Um, and when they were really offenses or att attacks or hate, they did not always violate social media policies because uh, sometimes they didn't get to the threshold uh, of really violating those policies, so they were kept uh, online. And it's not because they don't violate policies that they're not harmful, especially when considered in bulk, right? So one of the things we were also doing was speaking to those candidates and seeing the effect that it had on them. And um, this was really a, a striking experience, uh, learning the kind of things that these women are getting and how it gets much worse when we're speaking of black women, trans women. Uh, these women were getting much more slurs than the other women. And then we're speaking of how offenses were different when we're speaking of women or men. Uh, it was pre pretty clear that men also get offenses, but most of these offenses, they attacks or slurs, uh, they're mostly related to their work either in office or their experience, while when we look at what women were, was, were getting, uh, they were getting attacks related to their appearance or uh, to their role in their family. So for example, either as mothers or as wives or to their sexual lives. Uh, and that was strikingly different. Uh, another thing that I think is important is that we've been looking into research showing that Fear of such attacks is one of the reasons why many women fear uh, running to politics. So what I wanted to say is that uh, this has real effects in participation and in changing policies around women's rights, not only online, but everywhere, right? And because uh, online campaigns are so important for women, in the case of Brazil, women get much less, in, in general, get much less money for their campaigns than, than their, male counter, um, their male peers. Uh, so uh, being safe online, being able to express themselves online is really important. And uh, we're now doing a similar research looking at the profiles of journalists and we're also comparing male and female journalists. And what we've seen so far, we've only analyzed Twitter, is that female journalists, uh, in average, they get twice as much as a, uh, the number of attacks that male journalists get. And this also shows how it, it is already difficult to be a journalist in, in Brazil, uh, but it's much more difficult being a woman. Uh, it's really massive, uh, the kind of things that, that they get just, just being online and just doing their work, right? And I think one of the things that we are going to discuss further is that we have a lack of social and legal acknowledgement of misogyny. Right, that's almost everywhere in the world. That's definitely the case in Brazil. And that makes it so much harder to encompass the problem, to describe the problem, to make it visible, you know, to make it visible to the government, to laws, to social media platforms, to um, society at large. This is something that's largely not acknowledged. And I think that's the first thing that we should be talking about. Thank you so much, Mariana. That's actually a, ver a very interesting, um, a couple of different, the data points in themselves are actually, they shouldn't be surprising because we hear people talk about them so much, but yet they are because they're shockingly high. Um, and at a time where we feel that we're actually making a lot of progress and moving in different dimensions, it seems as if we actually still, well, you just really emphasized the fact that we actually have a huge amount um, of work that we need to actually focus on and really try and prioritize. Um, I, I would really um, like us now to move on to Cindy, because I think, um, Cindy, one of the, you know, Facebook now meet meter and apologies. I should know 
whether it's meta or meta, but I'm hoping that you're going to collect, connect to correct us in a second and let us know what the new official word is. Um, but, you know, technology platforms we've seen during the pandemic, we've seen how they have become instrumental in terms of just providing that ability to connect. Uh, we have also heard of when there have been uh, internet shortages, how people can have huge negative impacts on both livelihoods and also just in terms of connectivity. So um, I, I would really, I know that you've been doing some really interesting work in terms of actually figuring out how to tackle some of these issues. So Cindy Southworth from Meta or Meta, who I will be corrected in one second, over to you. Thank you so much. And I'm uh, just a, a note, the Facebook, uh, formerly known as Facebook, the parent company is now known as Meta, as in the metaverse, um, which I actually, it's sort of as much as we're all having our moments trying to get used to the, the new term, it's helpful for me because my uh, remit, I'm the global head of women's safety for Meta, which means that I get to work on um, safety features and work with engineers across the company from WhatsApp to Facebook dating, Instagram, Oculus, you name it. Um, I get to be involved in all of those topics. And so when I used to say that I was head of women's safety for Facebook, people thought it was just Facebook blue and not all those other, other um, platforms and technologies. But just a little bit about me, and then I'm going to jump right into your question. I worked in the nonprofit world for almost 30 years working to end gender-based violence. And in fact, back in 2000, I founded a technology project called the Safety Net Tech Project at the US National Network to End Domestic Violence. My very first slide deck talked about privacy and safety with Netscape, if that um, ages me just a little bit. And one of the things that I was looking at there is cyber violence. And what I expected was that the offline violence that we had been seeing for hundreds, thousands of years because of the patriarchy and misogyny, I my assumption was that it was going to start moving into tech spaces. And you know, whether that be, you know, the early versions of the internet, um, you know, with GPS, you know, tracking of people via their cars or phones, but and then unfortunately all of those predictions played out. I had um, spent 10 years before I joined the company, I served on Facebook safety advisory board and I was able to see what was happening inside with some really passionate staff trying to tackle these very complex issues. And so when this position opened up last summer, I was really happy to join the company to try to see what I can do to help, you know, A, use this platform to amplify nonprofit voices so that we can do that critical social change work that is needed to get at the foundation of misogyny offline and online, and then be what I can do with all of my colleagues to make sure that we're doing a better job of taking down harmful content, making sure that online spaces are safe for all users, not just sort of the privileged few. Um, you know, we know that freedom of expression, um, if it's truly going to be realized, has to be freedom of expression for all voices, women, marginalized voices, women of color, trans women. It can't just be for Western white males. Like we have to make sure that this, the safety mechanisms that we have and that that's sort of a, a mix of our, our policies, as a couple of people mentioned, our community standards, which we've recently enhanced just in October um, and added more protections for activists and journalists, more protections against sexual harassment, and also more protections against brigading and mass harassment. Those all just were announced in October. Um, we also look at all sorts of tools, and one of the things that I'm excited about is our proactive detection is getting better. So ideally, our computers will identify hate speech before anybody sees it and reports it to us. So for example, on Facebook, 96.5% of hate speech is removed by proactive detection by the computer before someone reports it. On Instagram, it's I think 93.8% um, is, is caught by proactive detection. Because of our scale with so many users, that's still not enough. Like we, you know, even 1% or a half a percent is still going to mean content is staying up that has to come down. So we're constantly striving to even increase those numbers. And then we're, we're working on other tools to get at some of those nuances. As you know, Mariana was saying, sometimes things don't hit the threshold, which the challenge we run into is, you know, we have you know, very comprehensive slur lists in every language that our nonprofit partners help us develop to make sure we're staying current with language as it changes. But it's hard to catch something that is really contextualized. So for example, I was talking to a woman, a Paralympian swimmer, she's amazing. And she talked about how often she gets comments talking about how she should be in the kitchen. And 
our algorithms are not going to pick up on kitchen as a slur or as hate speech or as an attack, but in her case, it absolutely is. So that's where some of the tools we've created like hidden words, content filtering, keyword filtering, people can put in words or emojis such as kitchen. If you're an athlete, you never wanna talk about kitchen on your professional page. Maybe you wanna redecorate your kitchen, that's a separate issue and probably on your personal page. Um, so it's a, it's a balance of how can we work with policies, tools, and then partners, we work with over 850 nonprofits on safety issues around the world. And then um, another tool that we just announced that I think matches what we were talking about with the Mexico image abuse law is just last week, we announced a partnership with the UK Revenge Porn Helpline. Uh, we launched stopncii.org. It's run by the NGO owned by the NGO, we helped fund it and helped build it with our engineers, but it allows people to proactively hash intimate images on their own device. So they never actually share those images or videos with anyone. It doesn't go to a nonprofit, it doesn't come to us. The only thing we get are those hashes, which is a string of letters and numbers, which can't be reversed. And then Facebook and Instagram will prevent the same hash from another, from the matching image from showing up on our platforms. And so, the, and we're hoping we're, it's set up so that there's a central clearinghouse run by a nonprofit and we're in talks with other major tech companies so that hopefully many of us will be receiving those hashes and preventing those images from being shared. It does not stop the root of the problem. We're also like one of my big goals for 2022 is to re-engage with a whole bunch of my nonprofit friends around the world that work on engaging men to interrupt misogyny because until we get at the root of this, I would like it to never occur to someone to share an intimate image without permission and consent. So like we've got some serious social change work to do, but in the meantime, I'm going to do everything I can inside the company to, to address it from an engineering standpoint, a policy and an enforcement. And we know we don't always get it right and we have a lot more work to do. So I'm thrilled to be part of this conversation today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Cindy. That was really encouraging in terms of laying out and, and helping us to look forward towards 2022. I always say that events that we participate in December of 2021 are helping us shape our New Year's resolutions. So I hope everyone took note of figuring out where they can actually implement that vision that you shared out in their own spaces and certainly look forward to, to discussing this, how to go forward. Um, Elif, I'm, I'm going to want to turn to you next because I think part of what we really have is we need to really also be looking at the power of multilateralism, right? The power of intergovernmental organize, organize, intergovernmental organizations and the role that intergovernmental organizations and particularly regional ones like the Council of Europe can do in terms of helping shape and um, shepherd others in terms of capturing those online learnings and then taking them out to national government. So um, over to you, because I know that you've been doing some fantastic work that we've also wanted to hear from. Thank you very much, Judith. Um, and thank you very much for the, organize the organizers for inviting me. It's such a pleasure to be talking here today. Um, first, maybe I should introduce myself very uh, shortly for those who are not familiar with the work of the Council of Europe. I'm an administrator um, at the monitoring mechanism of the Istanbul Convention, which is the Council of Europe Convention on Preventing and Combating Violence Against Women and Domestic Violence. But I will refer to the convention as the Istanbul Convention um, during my uh, intervention. Uh, and uh, I wholeheartedly agree with all of the other speakers um, that um, violence against women online has an enormous impact on um, the women and girls' participation online and their freedom of expression. Um, yes, the growing accessibility of the internet and the wide use of ICTs has created great opportunities for many women. It's connected them, it empowered them, all of us. It helped us to get through the pandemic. Um, but, but of course, there's this dark side of the internet that um, which we will be talking about today is the growing volume of violence against women perpetrated online or through the use of um, ICT technologies. And we can no longer ignore the fact that as the use of internet grows, so does the violence against women and girls. Um, and again, as all the other speakers uh, mentioned, this is a continuum of the violence that women and girls experience every day on the streets, at workplace, at home, um, and it is being spread, worsened, um, amplified in the online world. 
uh, but the root causes, online and offline, the root causes of, um, of violence is the same, it's gender inequality, gender stereotypes, uh, in particular stereotypes about male and female gender roles in the society, misogyny, and the general notion of women's inferiority to men. Um, uh, and also, um, women are disproportionately affected by online violence as, um, again, it was mentioned that yes, men are also targeted by um, online criticism, but um, it has such a huge silencing effect on girls and women and it seriously limits their potential in all sorts of ways. And uh, the scary thing is it's more and more being normalized. Um, so what is emerging is that much more needs to be done to rein this in uh, by states, uh, by preventing this from happening, by protecting and supporting um, the girls, women and girls who have been victimized by it and by holding the perpetrators accountable. And uh, this is where we believe the Istanbul Convention uh, offers such a huge potential. And today I would like to specifically talk about our new and the first general recommendation on the digital dimension of violence against women. Um, so the uniqueness of this general recommendation comes from the fact that for the very first time, a legal instrument provides practical guidance to the state parties of a binding international um, convention on how to implement these provisions in the context of the digital dimension of violence against women. Uh, so we, uh, with this general recommendation, first we um, seek, sought to set out definitions of key terms and concepts regarding the digital manifestations of violence against women, the various forms it may take. And um, most importantly, we provide recommendations to state parties in line with all of the four pillars of the convention, what we like to call four Ps, which are prevention, protection, persecution and coordinated policies. Um, and uh, first I would like to um, say that the Istanbul Convention was and is already applicable to online and technology facilitated violence. Um, it has um, provisions that are directly related to um, violence committed in the digital sphere, for example, stalking, which um, in the digital sphere, it can take the form of uh, surveying, spying or um, contacting the victim repeatedly on their social media accounts, stealing their passwords or hack their devices, um, gain access to their accounts or um, installing spyware or uh, geolocalization apps on their devices. Um, even on the Internet of Things, the, the smartphone devices are being used to um, intimidate and control women. Um, another article of the convention that is relevant to the online dimension of violence against women is sexual harassment. And as we all know, this can take many different forms. Um, Image-based sexual abuse, which is also known as revenge porn. All um, these new words that um, appeared in our vocabulary recently, creep shots and upskirting and deep fakes and sextortion and even rape threats and sexualized bullying. And also, of course, uh, there's psychological violence, which has been covered based on the convention. And I think we can all agree that all forms of online and technology facilitated violence has a huge impact on the psychology and mental well-being of its victims. Um, so um, the Istanbul Convention and the general recommendation offers a holistic approach covering all of these pillars. Um, and first and foremost, the, these recommendations address the state parties but it also provides recommendations to the state parties on how to engage the private sector, such as internet intermediaries, social media platforms, um, developer, software developers, um, media um, in the policies combating violence against women and girls. Um, for example, to give some examples um, from the, the recommendations, um, under prevention, for example, education, is the first and ultimate step towards eradicating um, all sorts of gender-based violence against women in society. And um, this means enhancing the digital literacy in the society, but especially among women and girls through education, um, means providing mandatory and continuous capacity building to all relevant professionals, because we also noticed that many of the professionals, um, especially law enforcement professionals, judiciary, healthcare, asylum system, they lack the technical knowledge and skills to combat this kind of violence. Um, this also means developing awareness raising campaigns targeting women and men, um, girls and boys, all levels and all um, actors of society 
from this particular um, form of violence against women. Um, of course, media has an undeniable role in shaping public perceptions on gender roles in society. So the recommendation encourages the state parties to incentivize media organizations and journalist unions to first abandon victim blaming attitudes and privacy violations when reporting um, on the violence against women issues um, in all of their journalistic activities. Um, and also to increase the number of um, women who work in the media sector, because as again, I think we all know that um, media and journalism is a large male dominated sector. Um, also uh, the recommendation, um, the recommendations also address protection services. Um, which, um, it means to be that they have to be accessible to all of the victims in sufficient geographic distribution across the country. Um, and um, to, to overcome these issues, um, the recommendation calls on the states to develop and disseminate information on legal avenues and support services to victims, uh, create ac easily accessible complaint mechanisms, preferably through online um, platforms within the law enforcement forces or um, prosecution authorities. Um, it also means that we should equip the uh, the NGOs or support services that provide protection to victims with the technical knowledge and skills to address this kind of violence against women, because we have been hearing uh, cases of victims having a tracking device on their phones, for example, and they seek shelter um, in, a, in a shelter that, that should be uh, confidential. But because of this tracking devices and because nobody is able to detect them, uh, or how to remove them, deactivate them. Um, These this devices make their location known to the perpetrators. And um, this is something that is putting extra strain on the already limited human and financial resources of the protection services. Um, also, um, as I mentioned, and I think it's very important, the general recommendation addresses the roles of the main non-state actors which are the internet intermediaries, uh, which include the ICPS, CIS, ICPs, um, search engines, social media platforms, software developers. So states should encourage these actors to establish mechanisms to provide robust moderation of content that goes against the principle of the convention, um, either through removal of the account of the perpetrator altogether or the content. Uh, or an information on how to utilize these um, uh, reporting mechanisms should be available and easily accessible to all the victims in, um, in languages that are um, suitable to the user base of this, these platforms. Um, also, again, um, law enforcement and prosecution authorities, they, they need a lot of capacity building in this area. Um, unfortunately, they lack the technical knowledge and resources to address this. Um, um, it, it is necessary that the state parties provide this kind of uh, finance resources to their um, law enforcement forces. This can be by creating specialist units or um, by through capacity building activities to, to forces that are already working on um, violence against human cases. And also uh, securing electronic evidence is very important and it's a very tricky issue. Um, this is another another thing that that uh, the the forensic capabilities should should be developed within the law enforcement officials, and um, also more often than not, violence against women committed in the digital sphere has an international character, which means that multilateral um, uh, coordination cooperation uh, is very important in this area. So the general recommendation promotes uh, international cooperation and mutual legal assistance to ensure first simplified access to evidence held by the service providers, uh, such as subscriber information or the IP addresses used by the perpetrator. Um, and second, um, to, to use effectively the communication channels that are already either formal or informal, such as Interpol or um, bilateral um, exchanges to communicate with each other. And the recommendation also encourages the responsibility of the ICT sector and, um, and suggests that the sector should adhere to very strict standards in content moderation and they should work collaboratively with the law enforcement when it comes to sharing um, 
the um, identifying information, the IP address of a given perpetrator or electronic evidence that might serve um, uh, to, to support the case of the victim. And uh, most importantly, the recommendation stresses that all victims of violence against women perpetrated in the digital sphere should have effective access to criminal justice systems. Um, so um, I mentioned the four P's of the Istanbul Convention and the, the fourth and the final P is the coordinated policies. Um, so the recommendation requires first and foremost, the inclusion of digital dimension of violence against women into all national strategies, program action plans on violence against women of all the state parties, um, as well as any research, wide-scale research and survey uh, initiatives in this domain. Um, the recommendation also promotes the establishment of effective public and private partnerships involving all relevant actors, which are the private enterprises in the ICT sector, NGOs and civil society organizations, equality bodies, ombudspersons, national human rights institutions, and state authorities. Um, so we um, try to show uh, ways to state parties how to engage technology companies, software designers, IT professionals in general, and of course, social media platforms in their efforts to combat digital um, dimension of violence against women. Uh, for example, online service providers can be a part of the solution by offering easily accessible effective complaint mechanism for users to report harmful content um, and the information on how to use these mechanisms should also be equally transparent and accessible um, and the ICT sector should in general be encouraged to adopt the human rights based approach in all stages of their commercial activities which starts from product design and um, and given the increase and this is this is also a very important and uh, disturbing issue um, given the increase in online sexual violence, uh, and we, we see it more and more in our country monitoring um, activities, filmed rape um, and um, recorded violent sexual acts, um, these are being more and more visible and being shared against the consent of the victim. Um, sometimes the victim doesn't give consent to the act itself. Sometimes the victim gives consent to the act, but not the violent nature of it or the sharing of it on online platforms. And there are many commercial entities that are making profits out of showing these um, privacy violating content. And we are um, calling the state parties to uh, address this problem by minimizing the production and distribution of such content when it's necessary. And um, Right now, um, in our agenda, um, digital dimension of violence against women is quite important. So we launched the general recommendation, but we also published recently a study on uh, the synergies between the Istanbul Convention and the Budapest Convention, which is the Council of Europe Convention on Cybercrime. So how these two conventions can strengthen each other. On one hand, we have the Cybercrime Convention that provides um, uh, forensic tools uh, international mutual legal assistance mechanisms. On, and on the other hand, we have Istanbul Convention that already criminalizes, criminalizes certain uh, forms of violence against women. Uh, and our study um, seeks to um, bring these two tools together and show how can they be used in the uh, combat against violence against women. Uh, so thank you very thank much. You. <laughs> Ellie, thank you so so much for uh, food for thought and different ideas. And you know, I was just writing collaboration down mm -hmm. as you started talking about the need to have private, um, public private partnerships and all these things. So I think there's been a huge set of ideas and thoughts, and I know that my mind is spinning. I just want to make sure that if people want to ask a question, this it, this is an open an open session. It is an open forum for us to be able to participate and debate. So I know sometimes kind of getting hitting on on and off mute is hard, but if you want to ask a question, please unmute yourself. I am looking at the at the button. If you're not able to just 
please put a, a message in the chat, a raise your hand function, and we will be sure to be able to sort out the sort out the technology or put it in the chat. But to keep us going, I know that there is so much reflection and I think the, the insights that I've taken are just a huge. From a procedural point of view, I do want to reassure everyone that there is a write-up. So I know if you were scribbling down madly trying to capture all the thoughts, other people have been helping us with capturing these, uh, these ideas as well. But I think um, the, the, the discussion has been very, very exciting. I am delighted that we did not focus on content moderation, that we actually, all of you came up with the, the need for different stakeholders to be engaged. And I think one of the observations is um, that I have is that we've actually managed to absorb a lot more of this. What is the journey and what is the trajectory of the challenge? If anything, that the breadth of the challenge that we have is huge because we're talking from shifting cultural norms, um, issues of dealing with misogyny to dealing with issues around data collection to also figuring out how do we actually in this very rapidly changing environment of uh, technology moving so quickly. You mentioned yourself, Elif, the, the, the need for us to actually be training, you know, police officers, prosecutors don't understand the technology. And then that critical point about how do we actually nail down um, the product piece and the product design piece. And Cindy, thank you so much for sharing all those insights about the work that you're doing in Meta in terms of um, and I'm very encouraged, frankly, to know that we have someone like you that's actually looking across the range of products and really taking a very holistic approach. So um, what I would like to do is give each of the speakers who want to take the floor an opportunity to come back and help us kind of capture if there's anything um, that you thought was particularly helpful if you want to kind of reply to what anyone else has said. But I wonder whether we could perhaps, because we are in IGF is a very unique as a multi-stakeholder forum. Maybe I could work my way backwards, um, Marianne, and go back to you, then Cynthia, and then Alif. And just to say again, from the multi-stakeholder perspective, what do you think are the one or two things that we should be focusing on? Where should we need to be putting our efforts on as we think through our resolutions for next year? Thank you, Judith. And um, I guess what I was going to say um, really reflects what you said to Cindy, because um, I also really appreciate that there's someone looking to multiple areas, because I think one of the problems, and I'm going to get to the multi-stakeholder problem, one of the problems that we see is that uh, these issues of women's participation online, they're really embedded in all the problems that we're facing in the online environment, right? And it's so common uh, that people treat them separately as if uh, gender-based violence is like a separate box that we need to tackle separately. And when we're looking, for example, at elections, it's very important that task forces uh, in, uh, uh, electoral courts or in companies themselves that they take up this dimension of uh, misogyny, gender-based violence, gender equality online, uh, and not just elections, but when we're, when we're thinking of journalism and the problem of uh, journalism in the public sphere today, that's like another issue where these subjects should be being discussed. Uh, and feminist organizations, civil society organizations that deal with these feminist issues or women's rights issues, they should be at the table, right? Uh, in these different uh, places and with these different stakeholders. Um, and I guess I'll close there because I know we, we have a little, just a little time. Thank you so much, Mariana. Cindy, uh, your reflections and, you know, how do we from the different, I should say my, my official job is in the private sector. My pro bono role is for the special rapporteur. So I do understand the need for bridging, but I find very often, um, you know, that, that kind of like how to work better with a private sector and in a truly multi-stakeholder way is not really understood. So give us your, your top wishes for multi-stakeholder engagement. 
I am um, one of my favorite parts of my current job is working on projects that I helped inspire in my nonprofit life. And there are features that Facebook offers, such as mute and ignore within Messenger and restrict within Instagram that came from the Violence Against Women community saying it's not always safe for a user to block their ex-partner. They may need to keep an eye on their activities to see if they're escalating, to know if they need to leave town to go to a shelter or refuge. And those features came from nonprofit partnership with a tech company saying, here's a use case scenario you've never thought of because it's not as simple as just block somebody who's dangerous to you. Like that seems simple, but it's not when, you know, you may have to deal with exchanging the children over the weekend for visitation and all of those types of things. Um, So one of the things that I'm really proud of is that we have very broad relationships and we've just launched um, a couple of months ago, a global women's safety expert advisory group. And that's going to be an expanding group. We're going to be rotating people in and out so that we get to hear from the most voices. But because everyone's under non-disclosure agreement, I can bring things to them before they're fully baked and show a couple of different approaches that we're considering with a product feature or with the policy we're working on and get really um, critical feedback. People are not, you know, they're not warm and fuzzy. They tell us if they think we're blowing it or what's not working right. But it's really nice to have this group in addition to the 850 global safety partners that we talk to all the time on lots of issues. Um, so I just would say, you know, please, one of our core tenants is we need to be hearing from people about what we're missing, where the gaps are, what we need to be doing better. Please feel free to reach out to me directly through any of you. I'll put my email in the, um, in the chat box. Thank you so much, Cindy. Um, Alif, you, you shared so many really detailed ideas that I hope other regions and other ITOs can listen from, um, but your thoughts on multi-stakeholderism and how do we leverage that to really tackle this, uh, this challenge that we have of online and offline safe spaces for women? Uh, yes, um, as you said, it's, it's such a detailed topic and I could go on forever, but um... Just one thing from the top of my head, I would say um, um, states should cooperate more with uh, independent regulatory authorities in the media and IC sector, if there are any, or any uh, journalistic unions, any um, professional unions, uh, to to sit together and discuss um, what can be done about this. Um, Another um, manner is, uh, in other ways, of course, the um the it's not a multi-sectoral approach but um the hiring of maybe feminist cyber security experts in uh in the ict sector i think that would that would really um enable to tackle the the issue from the, the perspective of the private enterprises um i could go on um to 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 involve um, the ICT sector and companies and um, NGOs in the education and awareness raising efforts. I think it's very, very important because this all goes back to the the historical roots of violence against women. And the earlier we start teaching a society about digital literacy and um, gender roles in general and um, both boys and girls and what to share, what not to share, what is consent. I think that's very important that um, uh, the ICT companies become a part of this discussion from early on, and and they support any state efforts in this area. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Elvira, I don't want to put you on the spot because I know that you are very graceful. You did a fantastic role in jumping in when the Security Council agenda changed. But if you want to say something, by all means, I, I think you you gave a very good overview of everything that that is happening. As but don't feel that you that you need to. And I know that we are at two minutes, so I want to just thank everyone. Thank everyone on behalf of the special rapporteur. Emphasize that we're in the middle of a process. This is you know we have done a report, but that really was just to get thoughts out there. Would love to continue to be involved, and I'll also share my email and um, our new website, which actually has a specific space where we want to actually gather and hear more information. And um, Anita, turning it over to you, and with huge thanks and appreciation to everyone at IT for Change. Thank you so much. I think uh, people have really taken time to be here with us. What I think I want to take away is what we started off with, uh, which is about uh, 
reaffirming uh, the fact that we all owe it to the great uh, deliberations of the Beijing Platform for Action and the various women's human rights instruments, which talks about full agency for women and nothing shorter, right? I mean, uh, it's unfortunate that just as we were beginning to think that here are my communities of interest, you know, here is a global citizenship that I'm going to really enjoy. At that point, you know, something happened and then the structures of the internet in some way also turned against women in, in the very ways in which it, it has given them voice and agency. So this is like, um, you know, a double-edged uh, sword. And here we are to reaffirm some of the principles. And I want to just recall a couple. One is about gender justice and breaking structural and systemic barriers, which I think we have to transpose online. We have to look at intersectional locations, women in political life, journalists, um, we will have to look at making the problem visible because of uh, the lack of social and legal acknowledgement. We really have to acknowledge also the international character of the problem because the in internet is a global public good. And the points about baking in human rights at all stages, baking in women's rights at all stages of product de development. So these were some of the thoughts I take away. And I really wanted to thank everybody uh, for having joined us today. We will prepare a report and circulate it. Thank you very much to the Office of the Special Rapporteur and others who joined us. Thank you very much, everyone. Bye.